Uh, I'm going to start tonight the, the same way I, I start, I guess, a lot of times, because I, I think as a, as a pastor, we're always sort of looking for illustrations. And for me, a lot of those illustrations come out of experiences I've had with students on, on a variety of different trips. Um, and I've talked about these before, trips that we do take to, to Mexico or to Milwaukee or to Puerto Rico and, and um, down to Ecuador. And, and this, particular, um, this particular illustration um, for me is, is based on our, our time down in Ecuador. One of my favorite elements of, of that trip is when we take our students out of kind of the mountainous area um, regions of, of Quito and we head towards the jungle. Um, we've been spending time, usually about this point in time of the trip, about a week, week and a half, um, doing ministry at El Refugio, working really hard. And this is kind of just um, to show them another area of the country. This is where we do the baptism service. It's about a seven or eight hour bus ride down there. But it's just one of my favorite aspects of the trip. I look forward to it um, each and every year. And as we were kind of heading into this, this jungle region, um, on one of the early trips that I was on, the bus sort of pulled over unexpectedly. I didn't anticipate that we were stopping and, and everybody kind of unloaded. I think I had sort of dozed off and, and didn't really know what was going on. And so we're unloading. And there's kind of this dilapidated house sort of across the street. And, um, and I hear one of, the, uh, one of our hosts, our missionary hosts, um, say that this is the Nate Saint House in Shell, Ecuador. Um, this is actually a, a recent photo because it has been remodeled and repaired and restored to help preserve it. But as we were climbing out of the bus, most of the students had no idea who Nate Saint was or, or why his house was significant because they weren't familiar with the story. But for me, I, I felt like I was kind of almost standing on at this sacred missions monument. Um, if you don't know the story, in, in 1956, from this very house, just outside the jungle regions of Ecuador, five missionaries um, flew from, from this very spot in order to make contact with the Warani tribe. Jim Elliott, Roger Udaren, Pete Fleming, Ed McCauley, and Nate Saints left from this house that I was standing at and never returned. Um, although this interaction with this tribe, it had started out peacefully, it ended tragically. And all five missionaries were, were speared to death in the jungle. Um, our own church has a strong connection with this story because this church had sent the Borman family down to Ecuador as missionaries, doing very similar, uh, similar work to, to what the Nate Saint and his partners were doing there. And, and, and our own... Um, uh, our own missionary families went to this house. Um, the wife, as she was sitting alongside them, comforting them, joining them. Um, the husband, as he went into the jungle to recover the bodies. It was this incredible, tragic experience. Two years later, um, the wives of these missionaries would make contact once again with the Romney people. The gospel here is, is beginning to make inroads, and, and it's eventually translated into their own language. And out of this incredible tragedy becomes this, this amazing story of transformation. One of the tribesmen who was actually responsible for the spearing of Nate Saint and Ed McCauley would eventually hear the gospel in his own language. He would come to know Jesus as his Savior. He would become an elder and evangelist within this jungle church that was planted in his tribe. If you're unfamiliar with this story, um, it's worth picking up a copy of the book, The End of the Spear. Life magazine um, heard of this story, and they published, um, they published the story of what happened to these five missionaries under the title, Go Ye and Preach the Gospel. Five do and die. The story of their sacrifice, their unrelenting belief in the gospel, and their compulsion to take the gospel to the places where it was least known. And what's amazing is that this story did not deter others from entering missions. What, what had the possibility of setting the missions movement back in the United States would ultimately launch um, a new movement of missions. Uh, high school students, college students, young couples hearing the story of the missionaries, of their service, of what happened, and were so inspired that there were thousands of people who signed up to go to the mission field. 
this, this event, which seemed to have all the potential in the world um, to limit the gospel, became the very thing that moved it forward. As a church, we have together been in a study, a nine-month study of the book of Acts. And we're focusing now as a church on our own call to fulfill our part in reaching the world. What does it look like for us as, in this community, as this gathering, where God has placed us for this season to reach the world around us? To, to reach our neighbors, to, to reach our friends and our co-workers and the people that we interact with every day. But, but to reach people um, all the way across the world. As we've been working our way through here, Acts begins with this very clear and compelling mandate from the risen Christ to his disciples and subsequently to us as the church. He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. This gospel mandate gets let out in chapter 2. There's this incredible arrival of the Holy Spirit at the day of Pentecost and the church is born. It's in its infancy. Peter begins to preach the gospel and in no uncertain terms and thousands of people respond and follow Christ. The church now is in something of, of a honeymoon phase. They are experiencing incredible community together marked by authenticity and, and, um, and generosity. In chapter 3, Peter and John heal a man who is crippled from birth outside of the temple gate. And again, the gospel is proclaimed and thousands more come to faith. And then we start to see the problems. The honeymoon is, is over. In chapter 4, Peter and John are arrested by the Sadducees. There's a very uh, growing movement to stop this. The same governing body that had overseen the crucifixion of Jesus now takes them into captivity. The church in its infancy now is experiencing very real growing pains. The church hearing the threats that Peter and John received respond in prayer and the Holy Spirit moves in powerful ways. And again, the gospel is proclaimed. In chapter 5, the threat comes from inside. The threat of hypocrisy, Ananias and Sapphira literally drop dead after lying to the Holy Spirit. The apostles are now facing more opposition. There's another miraculous prison break. They're arrested, they're beaten, and it says in Scripture, and yet they rejoiced. Why? Because the gospel is being proclaimed and people are responding to the truth. Now we pick up the story here in in Acts chapter 6, and what becomes another galvanizing moment in the life of the church. Pastor Jeff next week is, is going to be preaching through the first seven verses of, of Acts chapter 6, so we're going to pick things up in, uh, in verse 8. If you want to open your Bibles with me and follow along, I think it'll be on the screen as well here, but this is Acts chapter 6, verse 8. As we look together at the story of Stephen. And Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, and of the Cyrians and of the Alexandrians, and of those who rose from Sicilia and Asia, rose up and disputed with Stephen. But they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he is speaking. And they secretly instigated men who said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him and seized him and brought him before the council. And they set up false witnesses who said, This man never ceases to speak words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses delivered to us. And gazing at him, all who sat in the council saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Let's pause there for a moment. Because as we enter into this text, and we look at the life and the story of Stephen, there's a few things that I want to point out about who he was and how God is using him. And the first thing that stands out to me as we look at this text is that Stephen was a man of character. He was a man of character. It's interesting as, as we start this, 
Luke here seems to be very purposeful in recording and highlighting some of the specifics about who Stephen was, and specifically about his character. If you go back a few verses, in verse 3, and I mentioned Jeff will talk about this more in detail next week, but Stephen is first mentioned in these verses earlier. And the disciples are instructed in this infant church um, to select seven men of good repute, full of spirit and wisdom, to oversee this vital ministry that's needed amongst their people. In verse 5, Stephen is mentioned specifically as a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. As we pick things up here in verse 8, Stephen is described as one being full of grace and power. I want, I want to return to that here in a moment. Verse 10 comments on Stephen saying, but they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. Verse 15, interestingly enough, um, records it and says, everyone that saw him, that saw his face, was like the face of an angel. As we can see here, Luke is expressly interested in communicating something about the character of Stephen. I want to return for a moment to this description of him being a man of grace and power. As I think about this, this particular description, it's intriguing because those aren't often qualities that we typically associate with one another. If we think about something being both graceful and powerful, maybe the image of uh, a racehorse comes to mind or, or a cheetah, we can, we can associate those things together in, in the quality of an animal or, or maybe the image of an athlete, like I think of, of the Olympics. I think of, of um, the figure skaters. Uh, the amazing uh, skill that it takes to do what they do and to stay up on skates is, and part of it is probably when I skate, it takes about 12 seconds for me to have a concussion. But they are doing jumps and, and tricks, and it's, it's this expression of, of grace and, and power. Um, an Olympic swimmer, it's the same thing. We see it being played out with this. But when we're talking about our character, we're talking about who we are as, as people, it seems to me to be a rare thing for someone to be both full of grace and power. Typically, someone is, is either graceful and gentle and compassionate. They're sort of the soft-spoken type. Or we see somebody as powerful, kind of that type A, confident, um, driven, maybe even a bit on the pushy side. Here Stephen is described as having both. As I was studying this passage this week and I was thinking about this, I kept coming back to these qualities of Stephen. It, it, it strikes me because Stephen was known as something of a radical. He was, he was a bit of a trailblazer for the gospel, but this description also demonstrates that he was a person of balance, of both grace and power. You see, here's, here's where I think I, I've been misguided at times. I, I oftentimes think of the idea of balance as, as not going too far in any one direction. Um, otherwise, we become something of, of a fanatic, or as I mentioned, a, a radical. I think this reflects something of a cultural value, even as it relates to, to matters of, of our faith. We like our expressions of obedience to be within the realm of the reasonable. As a culture in general, we can still stomach a little spirituality, a sprinkling of the notion of God, and, and that warm feeling that we get around the holidays. But... But if we're confronted with our sin, if we're compelled to sacrifice um, one of our most basic comforts, if we are taught to lay everything at the foot of the cross of Christ and to forsake everything for the call of the gospel, then, then we can dismiss it as extreme or unwise or otherwise undesirable. I think here in the character of Stephen, we are discovering a different idea, a different understanding of, the, uh, of balance. You see, in Stephen, we understand that balance is, is not managing to avoid being too much grace or too much power, but rather following God in total obedience in every aspect of life. Biblically, then, I think that we can say that the balanced life is the radical life. 
Ajith Fernando, who is a, um, a theologian. He is uh, head of Youth for Christ in the um, Sri Lanka. And he speaks, he travels a lot and speaks a lot. He's, he's been a visiting professor at Trinity University. Um, he, he describes this this way. He says, while we may think of the balanced Christian life as an insipid life of moderation in everything that we do, a biblically balanced life is a radical life where we follow a revolutionary Lord in everything that we do. I think that he captures something that we discover in Stephen. In Stephen and in his character, we tangibly discover two vital realities they think we should each seek in our own lives. First, we see the transformative work of the gospel. Stephen is a man who is being shaped um, to be in the image of his Savior. This is this ongoing work of sanctification in our lives, taking us from, from the old to the new, making us more and more into the image of Jesus. We'll talk about this more in a little bit. But then alongside of that, in cooperation with that, there's the working of the Holy Spirit for us personally to use us in furthering the kingdom just like it was in the life of, St of Stephen, making him known around the world. This points us back to that mandate that we first received in Acts chapter 1. In verse 15, it's interesting uh, as this description goes on, it's interesting that these two realities are so pronounced in Stephen that there was this physical reflection of the glory of God as they looked at him, as, as they noticed him, as they understood him, and they said they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. It was so pronounced, so evident, so tangible that it reflected. Additionally, then, as we look at this text together, we can understand that Stephen was a man of truth. He was a man of truth. As, as we begin to look at this quality of, of who Stephen was, I want to pause for a moment to consider our own sort of tolerance for truth. If we're honest with ourselves, we all have a limit to how much truth we can handle, and God has strategically placed certain people in our lives who are uniquely equipped to test that tolerance, right? Do you ever have friends when you come into work and they say, oh, you don't look like you're feeling well. Are you sick? And you're like... Yes, yeah, I am sick. You know, like you, you sort of have this moment where they, they, they call you out on something and you're like, what's wrong with me today? Like, did I not comb my hair or brush my teeth or something like that? It's the worst when you're feeling great and somebody says, you don't look good today. Like, I love those people. Thank you. Kids are uniquely good at this. Um, small children. Like, well, Daddy, why do you have so much nose in your hair? No, nope, hair in your nose. <laughs> Both would be bad. They're like, thanks, sweetie. Go to bed now. We can talk about this tomorrow. My, I, I always notice this in caricature artists. Have you ever seen this? Have you ever had your caricature done? Never do that. Unless you're, if you're a caricature artist, I'm sorry. But I have a friend who was talking about, if, you, if you've ever had your caricature done, one of the things they do is they'll, they'll hone in on some sort of physical feature that you have and exaggerate it, right? I have a friend who said that she never knew that she had a gap in her two front teeth until she had her caricature done. And she was like looking at the picture and she was like, that's not me, you know, and went to the mirror and like, oh my gosh, that is me, you know. Um, those are cruel, cruel people. Um, <laughs> spouses, and I'm not going to say any more than this, that general category. Stephen here, he in this passage, he's now going to offer his defense to the charges that are being brought against him. And in doing so, he is going to test the boundaries of their tolerance to handle the truth. It's interesting to note here that the charges that were brought against Stephen, which Scripture says were manufactured, they're very specific charges. When Judea became a, a Roman, uh, uh, Judea became a Roman providence in 6 AD, capital punishment was only allowed under the decree of the Roman governor, with one exception. And that was a charge for an offense by word or by deed against the sanctity of the temple. In this situation, only the Sanhedrin at that point in time was allowed to pronounce and execute a death sentence. This is exactly the same charge that was brought against Christ. Christ. 
that they failed to convict him on. That's why he was taken to Pontius Pilate. Stephen here understands what is at stake. And he begins to respond with this uninhibited truth. Let's pick it up at the beginning of chapter 7. And the high priest said, Are these things so? And Stephen replied, Brothers and fathers, hear me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia. Before he lived in Haran and said to him, Go out from your land and from your kindred and go into the land that I will show you. I'm going to pause there because essentially what Stephen is launching into here in these verses is a detailed recounting and explanation of the history of the Jewish people, of the patriarchs who were foundational in the development of their faith, the law that they received through Moses and how God was working along the way to bring about the salvation of his people. What is remarkable here about Stephen's speech is that despite the fact that he is fully aware of what is at stake, he does not pursue a calculated effort to secure his acquittal. That doesn't seem to be his purpose. His defense isn't a defense of himself, but rather it's a poignant explanation of their history, of their patriarchs, of their laws, and how it was always pointing the way to the arrival of Jesus. Jump down with me now to verse 51. Stephen is delivering this speech. And I think for the first 50 verses as he's doing this, they would have many who are sitting there, many who are hearing this would have nodded in agreement. And then Stephen pushes their truth tolerance. We're going to pick it up at the end of the chapter. This is verse 51. After all of this, after saying this is how this all pointed to Jesus, He says, you you stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in hearts and ears, you always resist the the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered, and who received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. Stephen here is pretty straightforward. He speaks in no uncertain terms. It's easy here to look at what Stephen says in his defense and wonder if he might have leaned a little more into the grace side of who he was and a little less into the power side of his character if things might have turned out differently. Stephen's words appear to be harsh or judgmental, and, and, and in ways they were. But what is important to understand is that this isn't motivated out of anger or wrath. This is a response of, of passion. Stephen is ultimately saying, look, you're missing it. All along you've been missing it. You're missing our entire history, our entire story of our faith. It's all been pointing us to Jesus, the one that you crucified on the cross, and you can't see it. He's essentially saying in his passionate way, wake up. Don't you understand that you missed it? It's this plea on the part of Stephen that results in this third quality of his that stands out to us, and that is that he was a man of sacrifice. Stephen was a man of sacrifice. In verse 54, it says, Now when they heard these things, they were enraged, and they ground their teeth at him, which is interesting, and you think about that in contrast to how Stephen is described. When they saw his face, it was like as a face of an angel. Um, Here, when they're described, there's this anger that's overwhelming them. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him and they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of the young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And we had, when he had said this, he fell asleep. There's a lot here that, that I wish we had time to, to unpack in these verses. But I just want to highlight one major observation that jumps out to me. And that is the parallel between the description of the character, of the teaching, and ultimately of the death 
of Stephen with the character and the teaching and the death of Christ. Stephen, even like Christ, prays for the forgiveness of those who are carrying out his sentence. Stephen was a man who lived like Jesus. He spoke the truth like Jesus, and for him, ultimately, he died like Jesus. We know as we read this that there are Christians all around the world that read Acts chapter 7 with a very different set of lenses than we do. Believers where the threat of losing their life is not only real, but it's been experienced in their churches and in their families. This text is relatable to them in ways that we can't even imagine. We struggle when we hear this because we can't wrap our heads around a situation where our choice to follow Christ could cost us our lives. And yet as I process this, as I think about this, it occurs to me that the application of this text isn't about how Stephen died, but rather about how he lived. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16, whoever would save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Paul, who is Saul here in this passage, would instruct the church in Rome as he gets As he becomes the voice piece that takes the gospel to the Gentiles, he instructs the church there. He says, offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God as a spiritual act of worship. You see, we all give our lives to something. Every day, every hour, we are pouring out our lives on some altar. Most of us will pour out our lives gradually over the course of a lifetime. Others, like those, those five men in Ecuador, like Stephen in Acts chapter 7, will give up their lives in a moment of brilliant clarity. But we all give up our lives. Stephen was a man of character. He, he was a man of truth. He was a man of sacrifice. A martyr is someone willing to die for what he or she is willing to live for. Many of us, most of us, probably all of us, will never be called to die like Stephen died. But we are indeed called to live like Stephen lived. Would you pray with me? Father, we just thank you again for the reminder of your truth, the reminder of the work that you are launching as we read through Acts and we see this this movement that's eventually called the church and and how the gospel is going out. And there comes this time that seemed like it had all the potential in the world to shut everything down. But Lord, by your grace and your goodness and, and by the work of the Holy Spirit, this would only serve to take the gospel out further. Lord, we pray that we would continue to be about that work as we study and we experience and we talk about the life of Stephen. Lord, that we would look at his example and that we would ask ourselves, what is getting my life? We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.